Hello, this is Erica Podest and welcome to this webinar series on satellite observations for analyzing natural hazards on small island nations. Today is the third and last session of this three-part series, which is focused on assessing landslide hazards before and during an event. Our guest speaker is Thomas Stanley, who is a scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Welcome, Thomas, and thank you for sharing your expertise on assessing landslide hazards on this RSET training. Thanks, Erica. Disaster management can be described as following a cycle, and landslides are no exception. Often, the cycle is described with three components, preparedness, response, and recovery. In this talk, we'll be focusing on tools for the preparedness and response phases, but recovery and mitigation are just as important. The United States Geological Survey defines a landslide as a wide variety of processes that result in the downward and outward movement of slope-forming materials, including rock, soil, artificial fill, or a combination of these. The materials may move by falling, toppling, sliding, spreading, or flowing. Landslides can also be called landslips or mass movements. In this talk, we're focusing on landslides triggered by rainfall. However, global estimates of landslide hazard and exposure are available from the pager system at the USGS website. The, this uh, pager system tells you about the hazard from earthquake-triggered landslides. Globally, landslides cause thousands of casualties and billions of dollars of damage every year. The exposure of individual countries varies widely, but recent research suggests that the populations of some small island nations are among the most frequently exposed to landslide hazard in the world. This can be attributed to multiple factors, both human and natural. Fortunately, there are some tools that can help us understand landslide hazard before a rainstorm occurs. If preventive measures are taken early enough, some disaster damage can be mitigated. You can start to get a sense of landslide hazard by looking at historical landslide events in NASA's Landslide Viewer. This can tell you not only where and when landslides have occurred, but what types of events and what harms they caused. The Global Landslide Catalog contains thousands of points that occurred over the time period 2007 to 2018, so it's often a good place to start. It also contains a few polygons that represent the outline of historical landslides. These can be redundant with the points, but typically they are not. Notice that you can change the base map to show different kinds of information about the nearby area. In addition to the global landslide catalog, several other landslide inventories have been published here. You can see them by selecting the catalog view from the layer list. In some places, these will have far more information than the GLC. If you wish to share your own landslide database with the world, please contact us. We'd love to show your data here. You can also visualize the number of deaths that occurred in each landslide, or use a time slider to show a subset of the whole. By now, you may have noticed the download link at the top of the screen. All of the landslides can be downloaded in multiple formats, CSV, shapefile, or geodatabase. Another resource available at Landslide Viewer is the Global Landslide Susceptibility Map, which shows the areas that are more prone to landslides. To make it, we combined data on slope, faults, geology, forest loss, and road networks with a heuristic fuzzy approach. Then we use the GLC and other landslide inventories to check the resulting spatial pattern.
Here is what it looks like in landslide viewer. You can see that the one kilometer resolution is fairly coarse relative to small islands, but it still provides information on the relative susceptibility of terrain to landslides. You can learn more about this layer or any of the others by clicking on the three dots, then clicking Show Item Details. To download the susceptibility map, you need to go to gpm.nasa.gov, specifically the link shown here. Now we'll cover some of the resources that may help you during and after an event. But first, a couple of brief definitions. Landslide hazard is the presence of a mass movement that might or might not be dangerous depending on where it is. Landslide exposure is the presence of humans, animals, infrastructure, or other assets that are at the same place and time as the landslide. The global landslide nowcast shows where and when landslides are most probable in nearly real time. It relies on rainfall data from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, as well as some other factors that contribute to landslide hazard. Later on, I'll give a little more detail about how the model works, but first, we'll explore the data a little. You can adjust the transparency of this data layer to make it easier to see where you are by clicking on the three dots and then on transparency. And if you want to download the data to analyze on your own computer, use the link shown. The last 60 days of data are available, but keep in mind that each NetCDF data file is half a gigabyte in size because it represents the entire world at a one kilometer resolution. You can get estimates of the potential impacts from landslides in every county around the world by viewing the exposure layer. You can click on a specific administrative district to see the fraction of the population and road network that could be impacted by landslides. It's important to remember that these are just exposure estimates, not totals of persons and infrastructure that are actually impacted. The final numbers are typically much lower for a couple of reasons. First, just because an area is at hazard, much of the time, a landslide doesn't occur. Second, most roads and buildings are not built in the most dangerous locations within a given grid cell. So even if a landslide occurs in a given square kilometer, it might not impact anyone directly. Again, if you want to download the data, these exposure estimates are available at the link shown. You can download a shape file that contains boundary polygons for all of the level two administrative districts in the zip file and then navigate to the CSV directory to get a table for whichever date and time you are interested in. Once you have both files, you can join them in a geographical information system to get a map of landslide exposure on a specific date. Again, I want to emphasize that these numbers are model-based estimates of how many persons could potentially be impacted by landslides rather than observations of the actual number of persons affected. If you were previously following the Global Landslide Nowcast, you may have noticed that the last couple of slides look a little different from what you've seen before. That's because we just updated the underlying model from version 1.1 to version two. I think it's a big improvement but if you want to continue using the earlier version, it's still available at the sites shown here. By now, you may have wondered, how do we know where landslides are probable? The answer is that we use the Landslide Hazard Assessment for Situational Awareness Model, or LASA for short. As I mentioned, LASA 2.0 is the latest version available 
but I'm going to start by describing LASA 1.1 because it's significantly simpler. LASA 1.1 takes the form of a heuristic decision tree with two steps. In step one, it takes in rainfall estimates from the last seven days. From the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM for short, compares them to historical precipitation and determines whether the rain is heavy enough that landslides are possible. In the second step, LASA looks at the global susceptibility map in the wet areas. If the susceptibility rating is very high, LASA returns a high hazard nowcast. If susceptibility is moderate to high, LASA returns a moderate hazard nowcast. And if either rainfall or susceptibility is low, the model doesn't output a nowcast. The rainfall estimates come from the GPM core observatory and several other satellites via a level three product called iMERGE. The iMERGE algorithm produces a globally consistent view of precipitation with a tenth of a degree half hourly resolution. Here you can see a recent iMERGE time series with snow shown in blue and rain shown in a green to red scale. When we run the model over time, the results look like this example, Hurricane Willa passing through Mexico. I'd like to point out that the potential for landslides was not just located where the eye of the hurricane made landfall, but was spread over a vast area. We also ran the model retrospectively, which gives us a sense of how landslide hazard changes over time and space. I'll return to the topic of LASA version 1.1 later, but now I'm going to describe LASA 2.0, which generates the latest version of the global landslide outcast. Unlike version 1.1, LASA 2.0 is a data-driven model. This means that it relies on several landslide inventories. In 2020, we used the Global Landslide Catalog to train a machine learning model of landslide occurrence, but we supplemented it with several other landslide inventories, including those mapped from optical satellite imagery, similar to the ones shown. Instead of relying on a single susceptibility map to estimate the effects of factors other than rainfall, the model takes in several variables separately. These include slope angles derived from the shuttle radar topography mission and the distance to active faults shown in the GEM database. All of the factors, including rainfall, are processed through an empirically based ensemble of 300 trees to estimate the probability of landslide occurrence for each square kilometer of land surface. This map shows the model results during Hurricane Ada's passage through Central America. In order to estimate the population and infrastructure exposed to different levels of landslide hazard, the threshold is applied to the probability estimate. Then the population located within affected grid cells is totaled and summarized by level two administrative districts, often called counties. In order to estimate the population and infrastructure exposed to different levels of landslide hazard, ah, yes, this is what you see here is the uh, county level results. 
So far, we have been focused on tools that you can access through the Landslide Viewer web application. Now I want to turn to a new application, Landslide Reporter. As the name suggests, this app lets you record facts about landslides in your area. After review by NASA scientists, these details are published to Landslide Viewer for all to see. Before we get started with the reporting process, I wanted to share some reasons for making the effort. As you can see, there are definitely some benefits to scientific research, but it also has the potential to support your efforts to manage risk. I also want to remind you that when investigating a landslide, the most important thing is to be in a safe place. Do not conduct field work or look at a landslide up close unless you are an expert. When you first go to Landslide Reporter, you will be presented with a login page. You don't have to share your location to use the app, but if you do, it'll zoom automatically to your location. Currently, you need a Google account to log in. The Facebook login isn't working currently. Click on the G to sign in. We only use this sign-in to give you a unique ID. We have no way to trace back to your account or see your personal information. For legal reasons, we have to ask you to read and agree to this policy, which includes the requirement that you avoid posting material for which you don't hold the copyright. You can use the search bar at top left to zoom to your area of interest, then start adding points or polygons to the map. As with the GLC, we hope that you can add supplemental information about the landslide into some of these fields. The one required field is the source of your information. Use this to describe how you found out about the landslide. Did you read it about about it in the newspaper? Did you see it yourself? We don't have enough time today to explain everything about Landslide Reporter, but there are several guides to read at landslides.nasa.gov. You can also watch videos on the subject at YouTube. In addition to our online resources, I wanted to draw your attention to a special collaboration between NASA and the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. In this case study, a relatively small area nevertheless faced a big landslide problem. With science and planning, they were able to improve their management of landslide risk. The city of Rio de Janeiro has long been impacted by landslides, with the result that local expertise in landslide prediction and response is high. The city integrated a version of LASA into its operations center to improve the identification of potential landslide activity and issue warnings to most vulnerable areas. Rio de Janeiro uses 33 weather stations for routine monitoring of heavy rainfall across the city and replaced the global susceptibility map with a high resolution citywide map. They also raised the rainfall threshold above that used in the global landslide outcast. As a result of these and other improvements, Lhasa Rio has a much lower false alarm rate than its global equivalent. This means that the warnings can be taken seriously by local media and citizens. Now that you know some of the resources that are available online, let's see if you can run LASA on your own machine. I'll be going through the steps for version 1.1 today because it's a lot simpler than version 2.0. In order to complete this tutorial, 
you will need a computer that has an internet connection. And you'll need to install R, which is free statistical software. To download the code, you can browse to github.com slash NASA slash LASA. Next, click the code button. Then download the zip file. These files are relatively small, so it shouldn't take too long to download. Unzip the download into your working directory. To download the susceptibility map, you can browse to gpm.asa.gov and click on the link. This file is about 25 megabytes, so it may take a while to download. Or you can use your own susceptibility map, as long as it was saved in a similar format. Next, unzip the download into your working directory. It should look like this. Now you need the rainfall data from iMerge. This is more challenging because we need to download several files. You probably want to use a script to do this if you're going to run the model every day, but it's possible to get started by downloading them manually. First, go to gpm.nasa.gov slash data slash iMerge and scroll down until you see one day iMerge late run precipitation accumulations in GeoTIFF format. Click on it and follow the instructions here. If you're not currently registered with the NASA Precipitation Processing System, you need to sign up before you can download iMERGE files. You need to provide an email address, but this is actually quite a simple registration process. Once you're registered, click through to the GIS download site. Here, you can see links to the current year's output listed by month and all years listed by year. For a real-time application, you'd want to pick the latest files, but for this tutorial, you can pick any year and month. Click on a year, then a month. At the top of the screen are zip archives that contain daily rainfall estimates. These are what we want, but you can see other time steps if you scroll down. Click on the topmost link to download it. Then do the same for the next six data files. Although these files are of moderate size, it may take a while to download them all. Before we open up the archives, let's create a folder to hold the rainfall data. Next, we can move the data to the folder and view the contents of the archive. The file we are interested in is the one that ends liquid.tiff, which contains an estimate of daily rainfall accumulation. Extract this to the iMERGE directory. If you need to see save disk space, you can delete the zip file now. Now let's open up the code that calculates the antecedent rainfall index, which is in api.r. You can open this in any text editor, but let's use R to do it. We don't have time to discuss every line of the code, but let's look at a couple that will affect whether the script will run correctly. First, we need to set the working directory to LASA master because the script is already located in the same folder as its input files. Second, the line that saves the file implies that we have an output directory called API, or in this case, ARI. Let's make it now. The folder should look like this. Now we're ready to run the script.
there are multiple ways to run an R script, including from the command line. Today, we'll run it inside the console so we can debug easily if a problem comes up. First, we can select the, all the text with Control A, then we use Control R. It should run quickly on most computers. Let's take a look at the result. The last seven days of rain are now represented by a single weighted average. We're finally ready to run the model. Let's open up lasa.r. It looks like we need to fix the working directory again. And it looks like we need to add an output directory too. The name of the susceptibility map doesn't match the name or location of the map we just downloaded. So let's move that too. With everything fixed, the working directory should look like this. Now we're ready to run the model. Because the global susceptibility map is quite large, it will take about an hour to run, even on a recent computer. If you want to do a quick test, try clipping the global susceptibility map to a very small area, such as your home island, and running the model with that map as an input. At this point, you're already finished, but you can go one step further and take a look at the app model outputs. If you type variable names into the R console and hit enter, we can get some basic information about them. And if you type plot nowcast, R will show us a map of the results. You can also visualize the output file in the GIS. As we saw in the case of Rio de Janeiro, a localized version of the model can outperform the global landslide nowcast and greatly reduce the number of false alarms. While you could switch to a different kind of tool at the local scale, such as a physically based geotechnical model, there are some steps that can improve LASA. I recommend starting by evaluating the model's current performance and thinking about what you want to improve. Then you can try things like replacing the susceptibility map or rainfall data. Beth. Now it's time to switch to a live demo uh, in which I show the uh, how to use landslide reporter. So in order to get started with working with Landslide Reporter, first we can browse to landslides.nasa.gov. Slash reporter. This will redirect to the website. You don't need to use you don't need to give your location, but you can if you want the map to zoom to your location. You need to sign in with your Google account. So click on the G button. Sign in with your Gmail account. You need to agree to the policies or on posting privacy and takedown. You can find, read about some of these rules in this text box. Basically, they were saying that you need to be posting about landslides and not about other subjects. And anything you put up there, you need to own the copyright to. So please don't uh, post somebody else's work uh, store it here. We don't have the ability actually to find out anything about you, which means that we can't actually credit you for your specific contributions based on things that are recorded in here. 
That's because according to US law, we have to respect your privacy and therefore we don't collect any information about your Gmail account or you. So it's, we'll, we can add a landslide, but first let's find out some information about land, a specific landslide that we're interested in. So you might go to landslide reporter because you know specifically about something. But in this case, let's assume that uh, you have to look it up just the same as if I were to look, look for a landslide. So let's see if we can find a landslide on the island of Tobago. And we'll try to find one that occurred in the last year because it's more likely that a newspaper article is still there. This uh, website is taking a long time to load, so we'll try a different one. So here we go. We have a picture of a landslide. Which occurred at Mount Dillon. So I am not personally familiar with Mount Dillon. So we can search to see where that might be. Now someone in Tobago may know more easily exactly where this occurred. And so that's one of the reasons why we encourage you to make these uh, to make these reports because you are more familiar with the local terrain. But apparently Mount Tobago is in, near the middle of Tobago. Mount Dillon is near the middle of the island of Tobago. Mariah and Craig Hill. I suspect that I cannot search for these particular locations. Yes, it doesn't. Google doesn't know where that is. So we just know that it's somewhere near Mount Dillon. Oh, here's Mariah, actually. So this is apparently the location of a recent landslide. So this, this occurred in November article is dated November 30th, but it just says that it happened in the past week. So we don't know exactly when it occurred. This is not ideal. It would be better if we knew exactly what day it was. But we'll go through the process of reporting it anyway, just so you have a sense of how to do it. So here we can search for the same location inside of Landslide Reporter, and it'll take us to where we need to be. So presumably it's somewhere near the town of Mariah. So we don't know exactly where it is, so there's no point in drawing a polygon. And uh, I see that the app zoomed us away from there. But we can uh, quickly zoom back by searching for the location again. And Now we're located again at the same place. Now we can see that there is already in the catalog a point nearby. Uh, unfortunately, a limitation of the landslide reporter 
app is that we can't actually find anything out about this point to tell whether it's actually the same landslide. So we need to start the landslide viewer application in order to see what the details of this historic point. So to do that, we go to landslides.nasa.gov slash viewer. Again, we need to agree to some certain terms and conditions, but we don't need to sign in because this is just a viewer. You're not editing anything. And again, we can zoom to Tobago, turn off the layer we don't need. We can also adjust the base map so that it looks more familiar. And now we have the same base map. We can view the same thing in both applications. Now, if we click on this point, we can find out information about it. So this one occurred in October, October 30th, 2010. So it's not the same event. So now we can be confident that we're not just replicating this point that already exists. In fact, it's a new point at this location uh, sometime the week, before, the week before November 30th, 2020. So about 10 years later. So our source for this information, we're going to add the point somewhere in this area. We don't know exactly where it is. And the source appears to be the loop. So I'll type in loop news. That seems to be the uh, longer name here. And then we can copy the link to the information source right here. We need to change the date to the date that the landslide appears to have occurred. So it said a week before these, this uh, date, the, the 30th. So it could have happened from the 30th any day up to the 23rd or so. So picking the uh, middle of that, put it at the 26th. We don't know what time it is, so we can select time not known. We can give a descriptive title. And in this case, there's not much to say about it. So we can just call it Mariah Landslide. We don't have any photos about this specific landslide. This one might be the same one or not. And then we can describe any details of it. But in fact, we don't really have any details about the landslide at Mariah. So we can leave this blank. If you don't know anything about a landslide, you can leave these fields blank. This location description is simply based on the location we just placed the point at and if we don't actually know anything about it. Normally, if we knew that it was uh, next to some hospital or below a road or something, we might say something about it. But in this case, we don't know anything about it. As far as the location accuracy goes, we're, we can't be completely sure where it is, but it appears that it's uh, in this general area. And if we look at the area of Mariah and Google Maps, it's about one kilometer on a side. So presumably if it happened somewhere in here, we have an accuracy of roughly one kilometer or if we're conservative, five kilometers. Landslide category, if you have more details, you can pick a specific kind of landslide. But in this case, we know very little about it. Again, this is where your knowledge about the situation may be helpful. Now, we do know that it was caused by rainfall, above average rainfall, 273.7 millimeters, which is uh, significant. Uh, however, it doesn't say exactly over what time period this uh, happened. So it's not clear how intense the rainfall was. So we'll just pick rain as the uh, cause of the landslide, the immediate cause. The size, we don't know. So we'll pick unknown. So exact setting, we don't know. And we don't know how many people were killed or injured, if any were. Probably there were none uh, because the article would mention it. But we don't know that for a fact. 
So we'll skip each of those. There is no photo, and uh, we don't really have any further comments about this event. Uh, so we'll, we won't add anything there. And then these last three field, these last four fields, I suggest you just ignore. So then we'll hit click report it. It says, thank you, your landslide report has been submitted. And you can see that we now have a point on the map with a lot of information about it. And you can see that there's also an edit button here and a link to the original source. So if and if at some point we uh, found out more information about this landslide, we can go back to the same spot, click edit, and then change some details about it. So we can say something specific about it. Update our report. And now the report has, contains new information that we just added. So that's how you can make entries in the uh, Global Landslide Catalog. As we showed in the uh, overview of this uh, process, the reports need to be reviewed by NASA before they're published. So uh, don't, uh, they won't be show up in the Landslide Viewer immediately, but as soon as we're aware that uh, the report has been made, then we will review it. Uh, Although we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of manpower to do that, so there's a limit to how fast we can do it. So that's uh, all I'm going to say about reporting landslides today. But uh, if you're having trouble with the application uh, and you want to reach out, please go ahead. So that's it. Today you learned that it's important to stay engaged with landslide hazard regardless of whether landslides are currently occurring, and that there are several free resources provided by NASA to help. Finally, you learned how to run the LASA model with completely free software and data. Here are some scientific articles we wrote about these tools. Over to you, Erica. I'd like to remind everyone that you can access the homework as of today, and it's online on the ARSA uh, webpage for this training. The due date is September 15th, and a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who have attended all live webinars and completed the homework assignment by the deadline. You'll receive the certificate in approximately two months, and you'll receive it from Mariness Martins. So if you have any questions about the material presented during this training, please feel free to contact either me or my colleague Sean McCartney or Amita Mehta. Our emails are on, are on this page. Also in terms of the material that was presented here, um, everything is available online. So if you go to the training page for this webinar series, you can access both the presentations in PDF format as well as the uh, the recordings. And uh, finally, for those interested in um, being informed about future trainings, uh, please visit our RSET webpage and sign up uh, to our list server and you'll receive emails about upcoming trainings. Or you can also follow us through social media on Twitter. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box in the questions window and we'll answer them in the order received. The ones that we've received already, we've been uh, compiling those into a uh, Google Doc that we'll share with you uh, shortly on screen and we will go through each question in the order that um, they were received. So we will post the, this document, this Q&A document, to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Usually within a week we try to post it. And to end, I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in this training. We've covered uh, quite a bit of material. The first session focused on flood mapping 
and causes of flooding with guest speaker John Englander. Uh, we also had a demo on Google Earth Engine on how to map flood extent using radar images from Sentinel-1 and then assess the impact on uh, agricultural areas and the exposed population. The second session was on sea level change and how we can assess sea level at the regional to the local scale and this was a presentation by guest speaker Dr. Ben Hamlington and he covered um, the different causes of sea level rise, the different sources and some of the tools available to look at the contributions of those different sources for particular locations. And then today we had a great presentation from Thomas Stanley uh, really looking at landslide risk before and during an event and these are landslides caused by precipitation and he showed a, a, a tool um, that you can use to look at not only landslide risk but ways to report landslides. So overall this has been a um, presentation focused even though it's been focused on small island nations it, I, I think the the tools and the background is applicable to other areas around the world uh, where there are coastlines and that suffer from floods and uh, sea level uh, impacts and, and landslides. So I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their participation. Online we have uh, uh, Thomas Stanley uh, ready to answer your questions so with this I will end the session and open up the Q&A session. Great, so as we load up the Q&A document, we've been already um, collecting your questions. Uh, I just wanna go back and um, emphasize some of the key salient uh, parts of this training um, in terms of skills. There's been obviously a lot of theoretical information that's been provided and skills. Um, there's in the first session with storms, um, there was a Giovanni tool that uh, Amita Meta presented together with a GEE code to look at an animation of a, a hurricane um, and, and how to bring in precipitation and winds um, into an analysis. And of course, then there was a flood mapping demo that was done by me and uh, Sean McCartney on um, looking not only at flood extent, but really bringing in ancillary data to look at the impacts. And that's where this really makes a difference. It's not just about mapping, but it's really looking at what is the impact, what is the population exposed, what are the croplands um, inundated? What's the percentage uh, or, or what are the number of hectares? And, and that was just a demo. It wasn't validated, but you can bring in your own information, whatever is important to you and to your analysis. Uh, we showed how to bring in infrastructure. So if you wanna look at the intersection between flooded areas and, and infrastructure, that's also very helpful. And, and um, you can, um, as mentioned, if you have information on dams, for example, you can bring in that information layer on top of the flood map. So there are many things you can do, but the idea was just to show you how to get started. And you can then use uh, the codes that we provided uh, and adapt them to your area and events of interest. And obviously then there's a, the sea level rise, um, a really great tool. And as um, Dr. Hamlinton mentioned, the tool, some of the features in the tool are only applicable to the US, but the tool is being updated and uh, you will be able to access sea level change information for uh, the entire world very soon, probably in the next one or two months. Obviously, if you have any questions about that material, feel free to send him an email. I believe he did provide his email address. If um, uh, or you can always send me an email and I will make sure that uh, he gets your question. I will put you in touch with him. And then today's uh, presentation on landslides, another uh, really um, important hazard. Um, great presentation from Thomas Stanley. 
um, and uh, it introduced you to not only those tools on lines on, on how to um, view the, the risk of landslides and landslides that have occurred um, through that database, but also uh, how to report your own landslides, which is a great feature, and the LASA tool, which is a model. So I think it's been a, a very comprehensive. Again, any questions about today's uh, material, feel free to send Thomas uh, Stanley an email, or you can reach out to me or my colleagues, Amita Mehta and Sean McCartney, with any specific questions. All right, um, a reminder, the uh, homework is due on September 15th. So if you wanna make you, if you want to receive a certificate of completion, please make sure you uh, you uh, finish the homework uh, by the deadline. And also, you must have attended all three sessions uh, in in person live live sessions. All right, so let's get started with the questions online. Uh, we do have Thomas Stanley, and um, also uh, my colleagues Amit Tometa and Sean McCartney are online. Um, to get to your questions. So let's get started. Question number one. It's very interesting, but I wonder how big a landslide can be detected. Can it detect landslides less than one meter in width? Uh, Thomas, uh, please go ahead. LASA is not used to de detect landslides directly. Rather, it identifies where landslides are probable with a one kilometer resolution. There are other systems for the direct remote sensing of landslides. For example, the SALID system, which was also developed at Goddard Space Flight Center, uses an object-based analysis of optical imagery to map landslides. Of course, the resolution of the output depends upon the pixel resolution of the input images. You can learn more at uh, a, at a link that I'm going to give you in the uh, chat here. Oh, it looks like I can't uh, post anything in the chat, but perhaps you can uh, you can reach out later and uh, we can share that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the second question. How does one measure or identify the level of hazard by landslide? Uh, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question, but uh, if you are looking at an individual landslide, you can you can uh, consider different kinds of hazard. So, one way in which landslides can be hazardous is their speed. So in general, fast moving landslides are more dangerous to uh, people because it's harder to avoid them and, uh, because they can move faster than, than a person can move and also because there's less time for warning. Uh, whereas slow moving landslides tend to be more dangerous to property, uh, which you cannot move in time. To, or in many cases, you cannot move at all. So speed is one factor. Another factor is the size of the landslide. So uh, if it's a big landslide, obviously uh, it can do more damage. Uh, the, uh, the area over which it travels may be greater as well, and so it has more potential to do damage. Uh, another factor related. However, we should note that just because a landslide is very small doesn't mean that there is no hazard. Um, there can be a falling boulder that is uh, measured only in tens of centimeters, but if it's moving fast enough, it's certainly enough to kill a person. So uh, even very small landslides, sub-meter in size, can be deadly uh, if they're moving fast enough. Okay, question number three. I've registered in PSS, but I still can't download iMERGE data. What can I do? There should be a pop-up that asks you to sign in when you first arrive at the download site. 
which is jsimpsonhttps.pps.esdis.nasa.gov. If you haven't seen that pop-up, you may need to adjust the browser settings to allow pop-ups. Uh, if adjusting your browser settings still doesn't work and you still can't, can't access the data, please uh, contact the support at uh, gpm.nasa.gov slash contact, that's C-O-N-T-A-C-T. -T. Okay, question number four. Is LASA data limited to a certain geographic area or is it available for any area in the world? I am from India. Is there availability for the region? LASA covers the Earth's surface from 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south, so it does include India. And if you uh, go to our website and look, you will, should be able to see that. Wonderful. Question five, are there certain system specifications to run LASA? To run the global model, you need about two gigabytes free disk space and a large amount of memory. However, a local version of the model may require much less computation and could be run on an older laptop. So for the average user, you don't necessarily need that much uh, hard drive or memory because you'll be looking at a very much smaller area than we process here at NASA. Okay, question number six. In the month of July, a huge landslide occurred in Himachal Pradesh, India. Can I know about this using these systems? If yes, then please tell me how. So I believe that that landslide was, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it was not rainfall triggered. And therefore, LASA would not tell you very much about it because LASA is a model for predicting the occurrence of rainfall triggered landslides. Uh, the, and so there are other kinds of landslides that are caused by other factors such as earthquakes, uh, snow melt, uh, and mining, digging. Uh, so, any of those causes, LASA will not issue any sort of a nowcast for. Uh, uh, and again, I'm, I believe that that particular landslide is not rainfall triggered. Um, it could, be, if it is, then it's possible that LASA would have predicted it. Okay, question number seven. I have a Mac running on Big Sur 11.5.2 and would love it if it would be possible to have the tutorial to install R with LASA. I'm not familiar with R code. So we have not tested LASA on a Mac, but you should be able to install R. If you go to the R website, which is CRAN, dot r dash project dot org slash b i n slash mass mac os x uh, or you can just search for install r mac and you should be go to you should find that as a, a result fairly early and that will tell you how to uh, that will give you brief instructions for installing r on a mac and it also has links to the latest versions of R that you can download. Question number eight. If we want to study the frequency of landslides, what data are required? So this is actually a deep scientific question that we can't answer today. Uh, however, I will say that geologists studying this topic try to do field work to determine the ages of historic and prehistoric landslides. And using that information, they can begin to understand the long-term frequency of landslides. Great, uh, question number nine. Do you use the EMDAT database on disasters in your work? For example, in your 
machine learning models for LASA 2.0? We do not, but EMDAT is a very valuable data set for understanding the global impacts of landslides. One limitation of MDAT is that landslides are often recorded under the heading of a connected disaster, such as a hurricane, flood, or earthquake. Thus, it may underestimate the total damage caused by landslides. All right, question number 10. What are the thresholds to differentiate between high, moderate, and low landslide risk? Are they generic or country specific? How is the ARI computed? The ARI is a weighted mean of the last seven days of precipitation. You can see the exact calculation by looking at the code at GitHub. For LASA version 2.0, we use probabilities of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9 to separate the hazard categories for its exposure analysis. And for LASA version 1.1, we use the uh, different susceptibility categories as ways to separate the now cast into high and moderate levels, specifically if the susceptibility rating is very high, then we issue a high hazard now cast. And if the susceptibility rating is moderate to high, then we issue a moderate hazard now cast. Great. Question 11. I would like to work on landslide susceptibility analysis for a small region in India. How can I approach using this tool, LASA? LASA is used for dynamic analysis of landslide hazard rather than susceptibility analysis. But once you have a susceptibility map, you can use it in LASA version 1.1 to uh, develop that dynamic, to do that dynamic analysis. Uh, you may be interested in reading papers on landslide susceptibility that uh, are, have been put out, including uh, one on uh, landslide susceptibility with uh, random forests in Bangladesh and another on the global landslide susceptibility map. Okay, so question number... 12. Is it possible to develop the accuracy of a landslide susceptibility map with the global landslide susceptibility map? So, uh, landslide susceptibility maps are usually evaluated with reference to an inventory of landslides that have been observed previously. However, you could use, it is, in fact, it is often the case that one existing susceptibility map is used as a validation tool for another susceptibility map. Uh, this is not the most rigorous form of uh, evaluation, but it is possible to look at the global landslide susceptibility map as a baseline and see visually how it compares or quantitatively what the difference between the two maps is. Hopefully, if you are producing a local landslide susceptibility map, it is more accurate for that area than the global susceptibility map. And so uh, the ability of the global map to validate your local map is fairly limited because Hopefully, there will be differences, and those differences reflect improvements in accuracy in representing landslide hazard. All right, question 13. Is it meaningful to predict flood from rainfall index of a particular area using machine learning on supervised algorithms? I'm not sure. I, uh, I, I do not uh, work on flood prediction. 
Uh, and uh, in fact, we don't use an unsupervised algorithm. So uh, while I would be skeptical of that approach, I don't know actually whether it would work or not. Okay. Uh, question number 14, is it possible to get the slope pr profile of a particular region from a satellite? Does vegetation affect the intensity of landslides and can we correlate them using data from various satellites? So the slope profile can be obtained from uh, digital elevation models, some of which are developed from satellite data. The data set that is most commonly used at the global scale is the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM data set. That is the primary data set that we used for elevation in this uh, model that we used for the global susceptibility map and for LASA. The, there are other satellites that more recently have been used to develop digital elevation models and thus uh, can be used uh, to produce slope profiles. Those include uh, things like Tandem X and Aster. Okay, and question 15. Uh, Is there any possible... I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I should answer the second half of that question too. Go ahead. Does vegetation affect the intensity of landslides? So in general, uh, in general, vegetation uh, can reduce landslide hazard. Uh, however, it should be noted that this is not always the case. In some cases, having a lot of vegetation on a slope or having trees on a slope can increase hazard. It really depends uh, upon the specifics of the case. At the global scale, we don't, we actually don't see a strong effect from vegetation uh, on landslide hazard. However, uh, we do believe that it does have some impact. Okay, now let's go on to question 15. Yes, okay. Um, is there a possibility to use these models in local areas? For example, July 2021, uh, rainfall triggered landslides that occurred in the Konkan region of Maharashtra in India. So I think it is possible to use the models uh, for local areas as long as you're looking at the geographic scale. LASA is not suitable for uh, evaluations of hazard at kind of the site scale. Uh, at, if you're looking at the single hill, uh, you really should be using a standard geotechnical engineering model rather than a, an empirical model like LASA. Uh, where LASA is really best is when you're looking at a region as a whole. And while I don't actually know anything about the Konkan region, I do know that there were landslides in Maharashtra and that iMERGE picked up uh, this year and that iMERGE picked up very high uh, landslide, very high rainfall totals for that general area. And so it seems plausible to me that a system based on iMERGE or based on uh, a local uh, rainfall product from the Indian Meteorological Department uh, or another high quality source uh, might do well in predicting landslides in that area. Great, well, thank you. That is the last question. And um, I'd like to thank our guest speaker today, Thomas Stanley, um, as well as our other guest speakers, uh, Ben Hamlington and John Englander. Um, I'd also like to thank our RSET team, uh, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Hodoy, Odoy, and Jonathan O'Brien, 
as well as my colleagues, um, Amita Mehta and Sean McCartney, who played a very large role in, um, in, in, in getting this uh, training together and, and making it happen. Um, so this, uh, this is the last of the, this three-part series. Um, I, so any questions about the material, again, please feel free to send us an email, um, either myself or um, any of the guest speakers or my colleagues, Sean or Amita. And I'd like to thank obviously all of the participants for your always your enthusiasm and the flow of questions that have come in. Um, please, we will be sending a, a survey. Please make sure you fill it out because it helps us evaluate our trainings and also get a sense of uh, what your interests are in terms of future trainings. So before I close, I'd like to um, just open it up to um, my colleagues, Sean and Amita, if you would like to say some final words. Sean? Yeah, thank you, Erica. I just want to uh, thank you for a wonderful job, both with the, the Spanish as well as the English presentation and putting the training material together. And a very big thanks as well, how much we appreciate Thomas Stanley for joining today and giving such a thorough presentation on, on the contributions that, that NASA is giving in the, in the area of, of landslides. We do hope that this is applicable to many of the participants. And I will also uh, suggest that for those that might be able to use any of the, uh, the code or any of the information, the data sets, the tools that you're able to learn over this three-part webinar series, please inform the RSET team through the surveys that you will be receiving uh, in the next week. So we would love to get that feedback from you. So thank you again and, and hope you have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Amita? Uh, yes, hi. Thank you, Erica and Sean. Yes, it's a wonderful series. And thank you to our guest speakers, guest speaker today and also our previous guest speakers. It turned out to be a very informative series. And thank you all for participation. And as uh, Rika and Sean mentioned, if you have any questions, please contact us. And if you use any of this material, if you let us know how useful it is, that would be great as well. Um, so thank you again for participating. And we look forward to see you in our next uh, webinars. Um, in the survey, if you can help us by saying um, what additional topics, in what detail uh, we might cover that you um, might find more useful, please let us know through the survey as well. Uh, so thanks, and thanks to the RSET team for organizing uh, everything. Great, thank you, Amita. Uh, Thomas, any last words? I, I uh, appreciate uh, everybody who came out here to uh, learn about landslides, and I, I hope that it helps. And uh, please uh, check out the resources we've put on the web and uh, contact us if you think there's anything that can be improved or uh, that we can make your life a little bit easier in uh, analyzing landslide hazard. Thank you very much, Thomas. It's been a, a great pleasure to have you um, a guest speaker as part of uh, this training. And okay, so with that, I will close this series. Uh, again, thanks to all the participants and stay tuned to upcoming RSET trainings. Wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye everyone.